Let's pray together. Even now, Lord God, even now as in this moment your gospel sounds in our ears, even now, Lord God, as you invite us so kindly by such amazing mercy, as you stretch out your hands to us in your only begotten Son, oh, grant us in this moment, we pray, that we may be of a teachable, surrendered, responsive spirit, that we may wholeheartedly, sincerely surrender all to you. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. The Spirit of God is gonna direct you and your heart and your life through two texts of scripture in these next moments. The first one is in Hebrews chapter six, verses 11 through 20. And then the second one will be in Genesis chapter 22. The first scripture we'll read together that the, that the Spirit of God will address us from together is in Hebrews chapter six, beginning in verse 11. And in Hebrews six, verse 11, you're gonna hear the very beginning of it says, and we desire each one of you that's what the author of the Bible in the epistle to the Hebrews spoke. But when you hear that, that's what I'm saying to each one of you right now in this moment. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11. <clears throat> and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness and to have each one of you to have the full assurance of hope all the way to the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You hear the word, patience in this text in verse 12 it says that we need faith and patience that each one of us needs that the word patience is in verse 15 the example of Abraham patiently waiting and then you hear the word hope Brennan said that all of our singing this morning was around that feature of hope you see the word hope in verse 11 have full assurance of hope all the way to the end and then you hear the word hope in verse 18 that we have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope. And then you hear it again in verse 19. We have a sure and steady anchor of our hope. But as much as patience and hope are in this text, perhaps the most important ringing repeated word is the word promise. Verse 12. Imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. And then we see the word promise in verse 13. God made a promise. And then we see the word promise in verse 15 that Abraham received the promise. Then we see the word promise again a fourth time in verse 17. We need these promises to bring us through these rocky and difficult times. The people who first received this epistle were going through difficulty. Verse 12 says that you may not be sluggish. You could, actually, you could actually translate the original there in verse 12. The pastor is saying to his people, hey, you're getting sluggish. Stop being sluggish. And then in verse 18, it says that we have a, we have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope. You could almost translate verse 18, hey, I know that you're discouraged and I know that you feel weak, 
Therefore, right now in this word, I want to give you strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope. The people who first received this were in difficult times because they were drifting into sin and they were pummeled by persecution. And so the persecution made them think, I don't know if holding on to Jesus is worth it because the cost is so high. And the temptation and the pull to sin made them feel like, I don't know if holding on to Jesus' way is worth it because the way of sin and the way of the world seems a whole lot more easy and a whole lot more immediate. Well, here we are. Here you are. And I know you're going through the exact same thing because it is way easier to drift than it is to hold fast. You need to be in church at least one day out of seven, probably more than that, because the natural tendency is to drift. Everything around you pulls you away in drift, and to hold fast requires the Spirit of God, the people of God, the Word of God, the worship of God, all here together. And I know you need this text because you find it much more normal and natural to go your own way than to deny yourself and go the way of Jesus. Obedience is tough. Disobedience seems so natural and so normal. Endurance is tough. Patiently waiting is tough. It's so easy to grow impatient and discouraged. It's so hard to be strongly encouraged in the hope of the gospel day after day. So the reason you have this text, the reason the Spirit of God has speaking this text in your ears this morning is because he's going to ask you this question and he's also going to provide the answer to it, but he's going to ask you this question. Are you about ready to cash in on sin and the short-term rewards that it offers? Or are you going to wait patiently for heaven's holiness and the incorruptible joy that Jesus gives. Which one is it? It's so easy to stop trusting God's word every time we go our own way. We're not trusting God's word. That's the natural normal pull for us. We need a supernatural grace to cause us to walk in the way of obedience. The reason the spirit of God has you in this passage this morning is because he's asking you this question. Have you been struggling with this question? He's gonna ask you this question and answer it. This is the question. Are you seeking all of your hope and all of your happiness in this city down here on earth? Or by faith, are you resisting the earthly pull of sin? And by faith, are you seeking the city which is to come? The city whose builder and maker is God Almighty. Which one is it? And are you gonna keep trusting all the way through because endurance is difficult. Giving up is easy. Walking the walk of faith is difficult. Going my own way in sin is easy. And so to help us, to help you walk this way, he shows us an example. Don't you love examples? Examples make it so real. And the example that he gives us is Abraham, but please hear me say this. The example of Abraham is the example of God in the life of Abraham. Get that. The example of Abraham is the life of God, it is the work of God in the life of Abraham. The point of the Abraham story, he, he says it there in verse 13, God made a promise to Abraham saying, surely I will bless you. And then it says in verse 15, thus Abraham patiently waited. And then it says at the end of verse 15, Abraham obtained the promise. I love how he sets that out there. He says, God made the promise. What did Abraham do? He patiently waited. And then God kept his promise. The example of Abraham is the example of God's faithfulness in the life of Abraham. In, uh, when God made the promise to Abraham, Abraham, 
Last time we made a legal promise was probably last time we sold our house. You ever done that? We had to make this expensive, boring appointment at the, what do you call it, the title deed company with the notary public and all that. And we had to go there and pay them money so that we could sign 83 pieces of paper. That's the way we do it when we make promises. God makes this promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 and then God does the notarized ceremony of the promise in Genesis 15. You don't have to turn back there, but this is how, this is how they did it in the Old Testament. At the notary public, they saw an animal in half. That's what happens in Genesis 15. And then they throw one bloody half of the carcass on that side and one on that side. And then the two who are agreeing to the covenant walk through the split open animal saying, may this happen to us if we break this covenant. And in Genesis 15, when God makes this notarized ceremony of the covenant with Abraham very significantly, he puts Abraham to sleep. And God alone walks through the severed animals. Because the example of Abraham is not the example of the power of Abraham or even the power of Abraham's faith. The example of Abraham is the example of the power of God, the presence of God, the promise of God in the life of Abraham. So I want to see that together. You can turn back to Genesis 22 when the author of Hebrews says that God made a promise swearing to himself. This is located in Genesis 22. The book of Genesis starts with four things. Outline of Genesis, creation, fall, flood, tower. That takes us from Genesis 1 through Genesis 11. Creation, fall, flood, tower. And then in Genesis 12, we meet Abraham or Abram. And then from Genesis 12, actually through the rest of the book of Genesis is the story of Abraham. And I don't have to stop there because after Genesis ends, actually the rest of the Pentateuch is the consequences of the story of Abraham. And we don't have to end there. After the Pentateuch, all the rest of the Old Testament is the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham's seed, which is Israel. But we don't have to stop at the 39 books of the Old Testament. We already read it this morning. Almost all the books in the New Testament, they pick up Abraham, because it's the fulfillment of his story in his seed, which is Jesus Christ. But we see here in uh, Genesis 22, the story of God's faithfulness in the life of Abraham. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he, Abraham, cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together and when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. <laughs> 
He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said on this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Verses 15, 16, and 17 are the verses that are quoted in Hebrews 6. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. This is the word of God. May these words of God bring to each one of you conviction and challenge and comfort even as your life and your choices this day require. Genesis 22 is an unforgettable, a stellar example of Hebrew narrative of short story and the dramatic arc of a short story. The conflict begins in verse 2 when God calls him to sacrifice his son. And then the conflict escalates from verses 3 through 8. And then we reach the zenith of the conflict in verses 9 and 10. And then the conflict is resolved in verses 11 and 12. And then the rest of the story gives us a conclusion or a denouement that shows us everything that was happening in the characters of the story. Hebrew narrative, if you've noticed if you've read the Old Testament, Hebrew narrative is incredibly reticent about detail. We almost never hear what color were her eyes. Or were there clouds in the sky? Very sketchy on the details. So the details that are included are very important. And the details that are repeated once, twice, three, four times are profoundly important in the arc of the narrative. And so you hear that detail right in verse 2. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And then this detail is repeated in the very climax of the drama in verse 12. He said to him, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then this detail is repeated again in verse 16, the very verses that are alluded to in Hebrews 6, because the Lord, swearing by himself, says, I've seen, Abraham, that you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Note, too, in the actions of the narrative, the details are so sparse, but every step, it's like, in a, it's like the slow pan of the camera in a film as the music stretches to a crescendo on that absolutely the very arc of the of the zenith of the drama in the film all of the details he lays the wood, he, 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 he lays the wood out, he binds his son and all of the details here do you notice how he says in Verse 12, do not lay your hand on the boy. Notice how I said in verse 10, then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife. It's like, well, what else is Abraham gonna reach out with? Of course he reached out with his hand. But I, you actually, I found the word hand there in verse 12, there in verse 10. The beginning is, is you, you see it in um, verse six, 
And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand, in his hand, the fire and the knife. Why all this emphasis about Abraham's hand? Well, I don't know exactly, but these are the hands that Abraham lifted up to God and said, would you give me a son? And these are the hands that when they announced the child is a boy and he's healthy and they swaddled him up, these are the hands that received that infant. When that little toddler got muddy in a, or, or even worse, in a, in, a, in a tent with livestock all around, he got yucky. These are the hands that wash that little baby. I also notice that wood is mentioned in verse three, in verse six, in verse seven, and actually twice in verse nine. All this emphasis on the wood for the sacrifice. And I think there's a hint there in verse three. It says, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men, that is two of his workers, and then look at what verse three says. And he, Abraham himself, cut the wood for the burnt offering. It actually tells us that he had paid employees there and he didn't ask them to chop the wood. He cut it himself with his own hands. I don't know why that detail's there, but I could guess. The first thing my mind goes to is that as, as he chops the wood and the ax falls on the wood, the bark is separated and the very flesh of the trunk of the tree is revealed. And then a couple of verses later, it says he took the knife. And he knows that instead of an ax chopping a dead piece of wood, God's called him to lift this blade and chop into separate flesh from bone in his own boy. The example of Abraham in this crazy story about Abraham's faith is the example of God operating in the life of Abraham. So as Hebrews 6 uses this as saying to you, I know you're feeling weak, I know you're feeling discouraged, you have strong reason to hope because of this. I want to use this story this morning even just to point out to you four features of faith that show us God in the life of Abraham. First, faith doesn't question. Faith does not question. It simply receives and obeys. Faith does not question. It simply receives and obeys. It is remarkable that verses one and two God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love and offer him as a live sacrifice to me. And Abraham asks no question, but simply gathers the materials and moves. This is stunning. That Abraham doesn't question, he simply receives and obeys. This is because Abraham made it the habit of his life to listen to the word of God and obey it. How Abraham listened to God. Was there ever a time when Abraham would have been tempted to pretend he didn't hear God? I don't want to turn this pulpit into a personal confessional, but I can certainly say that in years of marriage and parenting, there have been times in my house when I have heard something and I have pretended that I didn't hear it. More than once. That's the way life is on this planet, especially if you live with sinners like I do. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. <laughs> But if Abraham ever, ever was tempted to pretend he didn't hear something, this is it. And a thousand questions would have popped into Abraham's mind. They've already popped into your mind if you're thinking with me this morning instead of sleeping. Abraham would say, well, God, why would you call for human sacrifice? You're the one that said we're not supposed to be like the pagans around us offering up their children to Baal. Why would you tell me to do this? And God, 
Why would you go to such miraculous lengths that a hundred-year-old wife has a miracle baby and then you want me to slay it? And you've made a promise to me that my, you know, my offspring will be like the sands of the seashore and yet here's my only offspring that has no children of his own yet and you want me to slay him before he does have a son. It's remarkable that faith doesn't question. And it's even more remarkable because if you've read through Genesis, in Genesis 18, this is significant. In Genesis 18, Abraham questions God. It's sort of a famous story where God, of all things, God's going to destroy Sodom, which clearly deserves destruction. And when God tells Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom, Abraham questions God. And he says, hold up. What if there's 80? What if there's 60? What if there's 40? And he, and he uses his hands and his lips to talk back to God about what's happening. And yet here, when we're not talking about the other, Sodom, we're talking about his own flesh and blood. The questions cease. In this most severe test, Abraham obeyed God. When to his mind the test did not make sense, he obeyed God. Abraham knew that God is good and that God is wise and that God will provide. Abraham knew it is not my job to figure out how God's going to provide. It's my job to obey and trust God to obey and trust God. Abraham knew, how often have I learned this lesson? I leak out this lesson all the time and I relearn it all the time. He learned this, who am I to question an omniscient, omnipotent God? The test of Abraham was really an example of the reliability of the character of God in the life of Abraham. And his faith didn't question, it simply obeyed. Second, second feature of faith, it's related. Faith doesn't, faith doesn't see future outcomes. It simply takes the next step. Faith doesn't see future outcomes. It simply takes the next step. Or it, to be technical, faith doesn't necessarily see future outcomes because every now and then God does reveal the future outcome ahead of time. But most of the time, faith doesn't see exact future outcomes. It simply takes the next obedient step. This is, if I, I could, I could prove this point not only from scripture, but I could prove it from your life. Not all of you, but a good number of you. When you went through something very difficult, you came into my office to pray with me and talk with me or maybe I visited you in the hospital or in your house and we could reflect together on the fact that we could bring two stools up here this morning. We could talk, you and me, we could talk about how when we got together and you were in your toughest time, the first thing that we tried to do was guess what was gonna happen. Well, maybe God will heal, maybe the kid will get sick, maybe this, maybe that. And then we realized, together we realized that's not the point of getting together. We're not gonna figure out what God's gonna do. And then we got on our knees and through tears of weeping, we just told God, we don't know, but you do. We're yours, we're yours. The present moment is yours, the future outcome is yours, we trust you. And when we reached that point, we were finally where God wanted us to be. Faith doesn't necessarily see future outcomes. It simply takes the next obedient step. Abraham's faith here, this is why this is a crazy story because Abraham's faith here is a counterintuitive, sight-destroying kind of faith. The only thing that his sight knows is God has promised that this son will be the beginning of a whole multitude and now God has told him to destroy him before he's married and has children of his own. 
And so it doesn't make any sense. He's pinned between the promise of God and the command of God, and he cannot see how the providence of God will make the command of God fit with the promise of God. And so he cannot see providence perfectly, but he simply trusts. Faith doesn't see the outcome. Faith just trusts. And you know that's what faith is. That's what makes faith so hard. After all, it's easy to go to the doctor, way easy to go to the doctor once, have him, uh, you know, like, like say, ah, uh, and look in your mouth, and then the doctor can tell you exactly what's wrong with you, exactly what you have to do to get better, and exactly how long it's going to take you to get better. But it's never like that. <laughs> They take a test. They say, maybe it's this. You go home and look online and freak out and then you go back and take another test. And it just goes on and on and you don't, you know, you don't, you don't see the future. That's the way it is. I, I've, I've been there with so many of you and I keep telling you, man, I, I know that as your pastor, I can, I can squeeze your neck and I can tell you exactly what it's going to be like a thousand years from now. But I can't tell you what it's going to be like a year from now. Three, eight, 18. I can't. How could I? That's not what, that's not what faith is. It's not what faith does. Abraham's faith is so remarkable because the same faith that received God's happy and gracious promises also received God's difficult and demanding commands. Abraham's faith is so remarkable because faith knows that it's better to trust God and obey than to trust self and go my own way. This is what we see about faith. The same faith that receives God's happy and gracious promises also receives God's difficult and demanding commands. This is the faith of the gospel. Jesus says, all your sins are forgiven. You have all the love of God for the rest of your life. And then Jesus says, anyone who loves son or daughter or country or land or house or possessions more than me is not worthy of me. The same faith that receives God's happy and gracious promises also receives God's difficult and demanding commands because faith knows that it knows that it knows that it is better to trust God and obey than to trust self and go my own way. There's a hint, you know, if you know the story in Hebrews chapter 11 that, that takes the... The verbs in Hebrew uh, hold a pronoun in them. And so when Abraham says to the servants in verse 5, um, he actually, the, the Hebrew in 22 verse uh, 5 actually says, Isaac and I, we will go and worship and then we will return to you. And Hebrews 11 says maybe he was guessing that Abraham would be resurrected. We don't know exactly what Abraham knew. But we know that he trusted God. And we know that he knew he didn't have to understand it all. He had to trust. A third feature of faith. Oh, this is, this is, um, this is the one. Third feature is this. Faith trusts that anything God takes from us. Faith trusts that anything that God takes from us is something that God first gave us. Faith trusts that anything God takes from us is something that God first gave us. It was already his. It was already his. The story starts with saying, take your son, your only, your, your only son whom you love. But how did Abraham get that boy? Now, we're not going to talk about the birds and the bees, but we know the normal way that a child is born. And the Bible says that even among normal, healthy 22-year-olds, th when the womb conceives, that's a gift of God and that child belongs to God. But in this case, it was like the woman was a century old and it was not a normal conception. So it was like on the top, on the top that this was the gift of God. But it's still the same that even if it's not a quote-unquote miraculous birth, it's what God has given God never takes anything from us that he himself didn't already give to us. 
Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped, saying this, naked I came from the womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord has never taken from you something that he didn't first give you. Uh, it, I'm not saying that it's easy. And my heart goes out to you because I know some of you have suffered loss that I can't even conceive. But I'm telling you from the word of God, God has never stolen something from you. God is not a thief. And he has never stolen something from you that was yours. God has only ever taken what he temporarily entrusted you with in the first place. And the only appropriate response is to kiss the hand of God because God gave and God takes away and we bless God's name. You ever have a song that, you ever have a song that just like gets you through a certain season of your life? A lot of you are nodding right now. I, I don't want to know the song. Unless it's Van Halen, then come up and tell me afterwards. But <laughs> Sammy Van Halen, not David Lee. But I had a song that got, I, I went through a, a rough patch in my life. Um, a season of testing and difficulty. And there was a song that I put, I probably listened to the song three times a day. Just like, trying to make it mine. The song is called, the title of the song is Thy Will Be Done. The song is written by Charlotte Elliott. The version that I kept listening to was recorded by Indelible Grace. Derek Webb did the vocals. The line in the song that I kept trying to sing was this. He's talking to God about thy will be done and he simply says, if thou shouldst call me to resign what most I prize, it ne'er was mine. I only yield thee what was thine. Thy will be done. My God and Father, while I stray far from my home in life's rough way, oh, teach me from my heart to say, thy will be done. If thou shouldst call me to resign what most I prize, it ne'er was mine. I only yield thee what was thine. Thy will be done. Faith, trust God to take from us what he first gave to us. And then there's a fourth and final feature of faith and you knew this one was coming. If you have the same instincts that I do, you don't need GPS and you don't need a road map to know where every line in scripture leads. The fourth point is simply this, faith trusts Jesus finally and fully for everything. Faith trusts Jesus finally and fully for everything. The story leads us to Jesus. We, how can you not hear it in verse two? Take your son, your only son. Take your only begotten son and show how much you love me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son whom he loves that we might be saved. The story leads to Christ in the question of Isaac, verse seven. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And Isaac said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering. And that question, the question of Isaac, where is the lamb? That question now echoes in every subsequent book of the Bible. In Exodus, that's the question in the Passover. In Leviticus, that's the question in the Day of Atonement. In Numbers and Deuteronomy, that's the question in the cursings and the blessings on Mount Ebal. In, in, in Isaiah and Jeremiah, that's the question of who will be the suffering servant to take all the, all the iniquity of the sheep who have gone astray and make it his own. And, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's asked and it's echoed and it's echoed until finally the very last of the Old Testament prophets walks on the banks of the Jordan River and his cloak is camel hair. 
And there's locusts and wild honey on his breath. And there's fire in his eyes as he points his bony finger and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's where this story leads. We can read it, we can read it in no other way. You know, there's a Jewish interpretation of this text. I, I actually found it in a, in a World War II history book that I was looking at during World War II. This was the most common text read in the temple. And all of the rabbis said, and it makes sense, that Isaac is Israel. And the forces of the world are constantly binding Israel and placing Israel on the altar. And God is always snatching Israel out and saving her. And I like that. I have such an affinity for the Israeli people. But this is not a sufficient interpretation of what God intends in Genesis 22. He's leading us and leading us to Christ. As God said to Abraham, now I know that you love me. So this text leads us to say to God, whatever you ordain in my life, now I know that you love me for you have not withheld your son your only son from me. Abraham's hand was stopped by the voice of the angel. The hand of the father did not hold back from the killing blow. The hammer met the nail. The thorn crushed the skull the spear plunged into the side so that we could say to God, now I know, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us, graciously give us all things? Paul leads us to say in Romans 8, now I know that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior. Now we know. Now I know. You have every strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is placed before you in Jesus. Don't you dare let go of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you and we ask you to give us surrendered hearts. Give us faith, give us trust, give us hope. Lord Jesus, help us to yield all things to you. Hear your people as they pray. And by your Spirit's gracious ministry, give us faith that waits and faith that endures and hope that is steadfast in your promise in your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea.
church. The word of benediction after that is, the word of benediction is not that life is easy. Walking by faith is hard. The word of benediction after that is this, Lord, haste the day. This day is hard. We all have Isaac bound on the altar. This day is hard. The word of benediction is, Lord, haste the day because a day is soon coming when faith will be sight and where all the questions that seem to unravel us because we can't understand and we can't make it through, the day is soon coming when faith will be sight and we will see and behold how God has loved us and how God's faithfulness brings us through. Lord, haste the day for your church when her faith will be sight. Even so, go in the blessing of God in Jesus Christ.